Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14 is our text of Scripture this morning. Let me just ask a question real quick. You can answer by a raise of hands. How many of you want to know and do God's will for your life? It's kind of a trick question because that should be an everybody answer that one positive, right? We all want to know and do God's will. Lucky for you today, this text is about knowing and doing God's will. So let me just give you some advice here. I want you to see how we can know and do God's will this morning. I'll, I'll give you some steps on how to know and do God's will. Okay, so sometime this week, if you really want to know what God's will is, find a secluded place. Maybe it's in your house. Maybe it's out in nature somewhere. But find a secluded place, and you have to sit in a secluded place for at least one hour. Step two, hold a lit candle in your hand. And as the wax melts, you must balance the wax so it doesn't drip off. If any wax drips off, you're not going to be in tune to the Holy Spirit like you should be. And the balancing is all part of the tuning to the Holy Spirit. So hold that lit candle very still, balancing the wax as well as you can. And then close your eyes and let your mind drift into your subconscious and let ideas emerge and finally your mind will settle into one idea and at that moment you should see the candle flicker just a little bit to know that that's the idea, that's the will of God that he's bringing to your mind. Once you've landed on that idea, blow out the candle. Once you blow the candle, it will seal the energy of the Holy Spirit's idea in your mind. Next step's very important. Then you start looking for the signs. And you go out in your everyday life, you start looking for the sign that's going to ratify that decision. It might be from circumstances. It may be from God's people. It may be from a random stranger. It may be something that somebody writes on a Starbucks cup. And you see in it, that's it, that's my sign. And it ratifies that sign for you and helps you know that was the will of the Lord. And then, confirm it with godly advice And finally, go to the scriptures, because they're kind of important as well. I don't see you taking notes on this. (laughs) Why is nobody taking notes? I just gave you this magical, mystical, wonderful way to know God's will. Do you believe me this morning? All right, where did I lose you today? Suddenly, as I was going through that, where'd you think, "Uh uh-uh, no, he's pulling my leg. Was it the candle? Did the candle do it for you? Maybe balancing the wax, did that do it for you? Was that your sign that maybe something wasn't right here? Well, obviously, I hope you understand the satire, that I'm not being serious, that that's not how you discern and know the will of God. But you know what? A lot of times when it comes to God's will and when we think about God's will and knowing God's will and doing God's will, we can tend to approach it somewhat mysteriously and in a mystical fashion. We often will think about it almost like an escape room, and you have to sort of puzzle together God's will and figure out how he wants you to get out of this, and you're putting clues together to figure out this mysterious will of God. But actually, it's not very mysterious. I was talking to somebody a while back, and they'd been searching for a church for about two years And it wasn't for lack of good churches in the area. They lived in an area. There were lots of good churches. They'd been searching for church for two years. And this person said to me, yeah, I just just don't understand why God's doing this to us. I just don't understand why God isn't showing us where he wants us to go. And I thought to myself, that's not right. I'm I'm like ready to pop. Oh, okay. I just was nice. Oh, okay. I'm thinking to myself, that is not how God does things. You're not waiting on God. You're waiting on your own likes and tastes and and reasons, but you're not waiting on God because God wouldn't leave you in the lurch for two years finding a local church. There's plenty of local churches around. It's his will for you to be in a church. You don't need to mystically, magically find the right one and take two years to do it. That's not how God works. But we tend to approach it like that, don't we, sometimes? We make it like a mystery. We make it like a puzzle. And that's not how God does things with his will. I want you to see in this text this morning, last week, Paul starts out with a greeting, but his greeting wasn't just a greeting, it was an agenda. He was setting the outline for his book to the church in Colossae. He's combating false teachers that are claiming that you need legalistic methods to grow in Christ, that you need to add things to Christ in order to grow. And what he says to this church is, no, you already have what you need. And so the summary of verses three through eight, Paul says you already have, and the proof of that is your love. Love is the mark 
of a growing, maturing Christian, and you have love, it's already there, it's present in your life, and this love comes from your hope, and the hope comes from the gospel that you heard from Epaphras, and he chains together in these first verses this logic, this outline that says you already have hope, you already know the gospel, you don't need anything else, please don't listen to these false teachers, they are feeding you a lie. And now today, in this text, he begins to pray. And if you look with me at verse 8, it says, and he told us about your love in the Spirit. And then verse 9 rolls right into that, and he says, for this reason only. For what reason? The reason of their love. For this reason, this love that we've heard, this good thing that we've heard about in your life. For this reason, now, we pray for you. It's so interesting to me to watch Paul's prayers. I always learn something when I read Paul's prayers. Because here what we have is Paul is praying for the good things in their life. Paul is praying for the positive characteristics that he sees in their lives. A lot of times the prayers that we pray tend to have a lot to do with relief from circumstances or difficulties or bad things. But what's interesting about this text here is that Paul is praying. What he's praying for is the manifestation of good things in the Colossian believers' lives. This is good, and he prays for the good things in their lives. And here is his request. I just want to show you how this breaks down in the text this morning. He starts out and he asks a request, and the request is this. It's right in the text of Scripture for you. It says that you may be filled with knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul asks, the request is that you are filled with the knowledge of his will. Paul wants them to know the will of God. Now, if you're tracking along in your Bibles this morning, I would have you look at this verse here, and it says to be filled. And if you would like to circle the word filled, it's an important word because it's actually in the passive tense. So Paul is saying, I want you to be filled filled with the knowledge of God's will. In other words, it's not something they're supposed to actively try to find, but instead the knowledge of God's will will fill them in a, in a passive sort of way. And so if it's going to fill them in a passive sort of way, then what do you need to do in order to have God's will fill you? If you're not trying to figure out God's will like a mystery, like an escape room, but instead you are filled with the knowledge of God's will, what is it that you need Now, Paul doesn't leave us in the lurch. He tells us, look back with me again in verse 9. He says that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, and here's how it happens. It goes on, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So the means that God uses to fill us with the knowledge of his will is spiritual understanding and wisdom. And here's where Paul is talking about the Holy Spirit. Here's where Paul is also talking about the word of God. And if I've said it here a hundred times, I could say it a thousand times and continue to say it, the Holy Spirit works in tandem with the word of God. If you want the Spirit's work in your life, The Spirit's work in your life is ignited by the Word of God. He works in and through the Word. And so here's Paul saying, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will, and the way that's going to happen is through the Holy Spirit using the Word of God in your life to show you what the will of God is. And so the question, how do we know God's will? Well, it doesn't start with pursuing God's will. It starts with pursuing God's Word. And when we pursue God's Word... The Spirit uses the Word to fill us with the knowledge of God's will. Is everybody tracking with that? Does that make sense? Okay, it's not a mystery. It's not a puzzle. You seek the Word, and when you seek the Word, the Spirit uses the Word to fill you with the knowledge of God's will. So that's Paul's request. And here's why he's asking that request. The purpose of the request is so that you walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him that you walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. Look at it in the text of Scripture, verse 10, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, bearing fruit in every good work. And so what it is, Paul says, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will so that you live out the will of God in your life, so that the way that you live is in concert with the will of God, so that you do the will of God in your life. That's why he wants them to know the will of God, is so that they can do it and walk worthy of the will of God. Now, 
Paul uses the word walk here, which is a Jewish idea, and we see it all through the Bible, the idea of walking. It's kind of a manner of life, but it gives you this picture that life is like a road, and you're walking along a road, and there's different ways you can turn. There's different routes you can take. There's different signs that point you in different directions, and as you're walking down the road of life, you have to use wisdom and discernment to know the will of God to decide which road to turn down and which road to not turn down and how to stay on the right road. And that's the idea that Paul gives. And what he's saying is that knowledge of God's will fills you so that you always know which road to be on. You always know which turn to take and which turn not to take. And that's what we want, right? The Christian life. We want to walk along the road of the Christian life. We want to know whether to turn right or turn left and we're encountered with different decisions and different crossroads in our lives to know which way God would want us to take and what Paul is saying here is that through the word and the spirit using the word in your life you can know the will of God so you know to turn right, to turn left, to stay straight, which way to avoid, which way to go and it's clear and your walk is clearly laid out in front of you. What does that walk look like? Well grammatically here in the text Paul gives us what that walk looks like. And so he's just moving through here the logic of this prayer. He's saying, I pray to God that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will so that you can walk pleasing, a manner that's pleasing to God. And here's what a pleasing walk with God looks like. And he gives us three characteristics of a pleasing walk with God. And he lays it out right here in the text. And it says, starting in verse 10, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. So here's the three characteristics. God directs our walk on life's path through the riches we have in Christ. That's the big idea throughout the rest of the book, but especially here in this text. God directs our paths through life's roads through the riches that we have in Christ, and then he gives us what this looks like. He gives us the characteristics of someone who's walking on life's paths the right way. And so we see three characteristics of someone walking right in the middle of God's will, and the first one is this growing and showing. You're growing and showing. You're growing in the knowledge of God and you're showing the works of God. Look what it says again in verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing and bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. Now that's two things, but the way it's grammatically stitched together, it's really one thing. And those two ideas growing in the knowledge of God and bearing fruit in every good work are tied together. They have a symbiotic relationship, you might say. The one affects the other. The more you know about the word, the more you grow in your works. The more you do good works, the more you know, and they relate to each other. They're tied together. It's not just knowing. It's also showing. It's not just doing works, but it's also knowing. You see, I know a lot of people that know a lot about the Word of God, and they are just, honestly, pretty awful people. And so it's not just knowing. That doesn't do it alone. But it's also showing. It's putting that knowledge to work. James says it like this. Don't be just hearers of the Word, but what? Doers of the Word also. James says it like that. Paul says it like this, growing in the knowledge of his word and also growing and showing, bearing fruit in every good work. And so we know what we're supposed to do. We understand the word and that comes out in good things and good works. And the more we do good works, the more we grow in our knowledge of God. You see, I think the problem in our world, the problem with Christianity, the problem with a lot of Christians is that we really don't know enough about the Bible. Sometimes people would say we know too much. I don't think we know too much. Sometimes people read their Bibles kind of like a fortune cookie, right? You just get your fortune cookie for the day, crack that thing open. I mean, who doesn't like fortune cookies, right? I mean, fortune cookies are amazing. You take the little thing out and you read the, the fortune. There's always a misspelled word on it, and that's always fun looking at the fortune, right? It's just kind of this pick-me-up for the day. And that's how a lot of people read the Bible, Read it like a fortune cookie. Just give me a little verse here or there. Decide, okay, I need to do my devotions today. Let's see, where should I go for my devotions today? God, direct me right here. Now, that's encouraging. The Assyrians are going to come and slaughter all of our children. What do I do with that, (laughs) right? How do I apply that to my life? It's reading the Bible like a fortune cookie. Even preaching goes like this sometimes. Texts of Scripture just strung together in random order to promote more what the preacher wants to say instead of what the Bible wants to say. 
See, the problem isn't too much biblical knowledge. The problem is we don't understand truth in a systematic way from start to finish, all fused together. And that's what Paul is saying. I want you to know and know in such a way that relates to showing the fruit, the works, doing good things. There's a tie between those two things. I have a friend here in this church. He took a Bible reading challenge this year. He's reading a lot of Bible every day. And it was just kind of through talking with him. I'm doing a Bible reading challenge like that. He's doing a Bible reading challenge. And he said this to me recently. He said it's literally, you know, people like to say this, right? We talk about diets and other things, but he was serious. It literally changed his life. I mean, it, it wasn't like other things that change your life. I mean, this like actually, he says, literally changed my life. Why? He says, reading that much scripture has guided me. It's helped me understand life better. It's helped me make decisions better. It's helped me shape the way I view my business and the decisions that are in my business on a daily basis. And then he ended it with this, and this is the key thing. He said this, reading that much scripture on a daily basis has helped me get to understand the mind of God better. That's key. You see, if we understand the mind of God, Then we're on life's paths. We can walk worthy of God because we understand how God thinks and we understand what God wants. And when we see a turn down a different road, we know we don't go that direction because that's not how God thinks. That's not wise. And so there's this tie between knowing but then showing. Knowing what he wants results in how we live that out. Someone said it like this. To receive the gospel is to come to know God. To know God is to do his will. And to do God's will is to know more and more of God. In other words, the more we do God's will and show, do the works, it actually increases our knowledge. There's a tie between doing and knowing. Last week, I had to work on some siding on my house. Now, before you think that I'm some genius craftsman, I will admit the fact that I hired my neighbor who's in construction to help do the siding. Now, I've got two reasons for this. He's really good at what he does, and I need the help. And number two, it gets him stuck with a pastor for about 13 hours over two days, which is a great thing, right? I get to talk to him. I get to hear, like, you know, all this foul language, and and that's really good for me as well because it roots me in what real life is like, and then we get to talk. But it it was a good time working on the house together. We got to chat about different things, but he helped me with the house. Now, I've got some knowledge on how to do some of those things, just Bits and pieces. I've got like fortune cookie knowledge about how to do some of those things. I can do a couple of things. Now, getting ready for this project, I could have read every book there was to read. I could have read five books on how to rework a soffit and flash it next to the roof line in the siding and then redo this. I could have read books on that and filled my mind with knowledge. Would I have been prepared to do the job? Well, some of you would probably say, yeah, I would say no, right? Probably not a good idea, just filling my mind with knowledge. Now, I could take that knowledge and start to do something with it, but I don't want to do it on my house. I'll do it on somebody else's house, right? That's how I'll learn how to do it. It's scary to actually step out and do some things, but you see, you take the knowledge, you begin to apply it, and as you apply it, guess what happens? The knowledge grows as well. Like, all the knowledge could be there. I could read all these books about it. I could fill my mind with the knowledge, but really not know how to do it yet. Even though I have the knowledge, starting to do it and put that into practice actually increases the knowledge. And as the knowledge increases, I actually do the job better. Now, let me show you something. This part of the sighting right there, those little pieces that go down, I did that all by myself. I nailed every one of those pieces of sighting up with my hand and a hammer and nails. This is where you're supposed to applaud. Thank you. Very proud of that. All by myself. Now, I did that by myself. I'll tell you what I did not do. I did not rework that soffit, okay? He did that. It was all rotted out underneath there, and he rebuilt that soffit for me. I did not do that because I know it. I can see it. I see what needs to be done, but that knowledge has to transfer into works, and I'm just not ready to do that yet, right? He can do it. He has the knowledge. He can come to that job, and he sees it. And because of his knowledge, he knows the right path to take. 
He knows how to walk down that road. He knows what he's going to encounter. And when we open it up and we see that there's more rot than we expected, he knows what to do because he understands it intellectually, but he's also experienced it and personally worked on it. And the more he works on it, the more knowledge he gains, the more knowledge he gains, the more he can work on it. It just increases knowing and showing, showing and knowing. Everybody tracking? You got that? That's what Paul's saying here. You want to do God's will? It starts with knowing. Knowing the mind of God. Understanding how God works. Plumbing into the Word. Knowing Christ through the Word. So that when you're on that path of life and you see different ways you can turn, I can go this way, I can go that way, you understand, no, I don't need to go this way. And as you pass those roads and as you make those decisions, those works begin to come out of you tangibly and as you're doing the work guess what you're gaining confidence in, in knowledge and the knowledge is strengthened through living out those decisions in God's will there's this tie between those two things just like my neighbor understands how to do the job and he does the job and the more he does the job and experience he gets the better he knows it for the next time now hopefully if this happens again I can do it all by myself but I probably won't because I just don't have the confidence yet but over time, in doing it more, you gain the confidence. That's what Paul says here in the text. Verse 10, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord. What does it look like to walk worthy of the Lord? Bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of him. Growing in the knowledge of him and bearing fruit in every good work. Bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of him. <laughs> Tied together. They grow together, symbiotically. So let's go on to the next idea here. As he says, knowing and showing works together. That's a mark of somebody who is in God's will, but the second mark of somebody, characteristic of somebody who's in the middle of God's will is that they are enduring. Enduring. Look what it says next in the text, verse 11, being strengthened. And what's happening here grammatically is he ties this all together. And so being strengthened goes both ways. Being strengthened goes backwards. And so we know God's will. We know more about him. And we are doing things in his will, the knowing and showing. And we're being strengthened in doing that. And so the strengthen goes back, but the strengthen also goes forward as well. Being strengthened in what? What does it say? Verse 11, being strengthened with all power. What kind of power is this? Well, Ephesians makes it more specific and says the power that God strengthens us with to do his will is the very same power that he used to raise Jesus from the dead. Now, how great a power is that? Yes, thank you for the Half-hearted amen. I'm, I'm kidding. It's great. It's a yee-haw type of power. It's huge. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the power that he strengthens us with to know. And then moving on to endure. Look what it says. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you might have great endurance and patience. Somebody walking in the middle of God's will is marked with great endurance. But not just endurance like the Stoics, like first century philosophy that would just kind of be a self-mutilating type of endurance where you just grit and bear it. You just have this scowl on your face and you're getting through. That's not what he's saying. To do it with patience. And then the next word in the text is joyfully. So this joyful, patient endurance. Now let me help you understand what's happening here in the text. I cannot minimize the importance of this. This is a mark of somebody who's in the middle of God's will, that they are having endurance. They're patiently enduring. Patiently enduring indicates for me that there's going to be hard times and difficult circumstances and catastrophic suffering in the Christian life. Remember, we're talking about someone who's in the middle of God's will. Sometimes we think, and sometimes you'll hear Christian teaching that says this, if you're in the middle of God's will, you can expect to not have suffering. And that's how we think too. Bad things happen, and our first response is, what did I do to make God so mad? How did I step outside of God's will? Now, please note what the text is telling us. 
a mark of somebody, listen, a mark of somebody who's in the middle of God's will is somebody who endures patiently. What does enduring patiently have to do with it? It has to do with hard times. It has to do with difficulty. It has to do with persecution. It has to do with suffering. It has to do with difficult things in your life. And so Paul is not saying that being in the middle of God's will means you get a free pass for these things. What he's saying is that being in the middle of God's will means that you will have suffering, you will have difficult circumstances, but the mark of somebody who's in the middle of God's will is they take those things that come their way and they endure patiently through them. And why can you endure patiently through them? Well, let's just work our way back up the chain here in the text. The reason you can endure those things patiently is because you're filled with the knowledge of who God is. And part of the knowledge of who God is is to understand that he is absolutely 100% sovereign over everything. And so it all kind of fits together, you see. Paul's woven this thing together so it all fits and it all works together. We know God's will and he helps us to live that out and we're doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit, being strengthened with that kind of power to endure patiently the things that come our way. And then he goes on to the next idea. We also have a person in the middle of God's will who is thanking, a thankful or thanking person. Look what it says in verse 12. At the end of verse 11, it says, joyfully giving thanks. And so the word joyfully goes both ways. Just like in verse 11, the word being strengthened goes both ways. Being strengthened looks back at what he just said, and it looks forward. Joyfully, here at the end of verse 11, goes back. So we're supposed to endure patiently, joyfully, but then it goes forward as well to the next mark of somebody who's in the middle of God's will. And this is what it's supposed to look like. You're joyfully enduring, but you're also joyfully giving thanks To the Father, somebody who's in the middle of God's will, is a joyfully thankful person. Somebody who's seen life's circumstances and can give God thanks for the circumstances. Why? Because you're patiently enduring in His great power and might that He used to raise Jesus from the dead. Why? Because you understand who He is and you're filled with the knowledge of who He is and that's coming out in your life by the way that you're living and you're walking down that path of life and you're making the right decisions because you know God. And because you know God, you can endure. And because you can endure, you're doing it patiently and joyfully. And as you're joyful, you're thanking God for everything that he's done. What all has he done? Well, thank you, Paul, for telling us what all God has done. And now he ends this little section by giving us three reasons why we should be thanking God. So here's the three reasons for our thanksgiving. Look what it says in verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. We're thankful because we've been qualified. God's qualified us to share in an inheritance that was not ours previously. Now this goes back to the Old Testament idea of Israel receiving an inheritance, but now we've been brought into God's blessing as well, and we have an inheritance that's awaiting us in heaven. We've been qualified for that inheritance. We did not qualify ourselves. We did not make ourselves qualified for the inheritance. God qualified us through the atoning blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ by taking our sin and making us righteous and giving us a righteous standing before Him. And so no matter what's happening in your life, No matter what you're enduring, if you're in the middle of God's will and circumstances are falling in all around you, you can still give God thanks. Why? Because it doesn't really matter what happens here. I've been qualified for an inheritance that's in heaven that's imperishable and undefiled and will never fade away. And it's mine because of what Jesus did for me. Isn't that amazing? He goes on and he tells us the next reason we should be thankful because we've been rescued. Look what he says here. Giving thanks, verse 12, to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness. I love that phrase. Isn't that great? It sounds like some kind of a movie, doesn't it? Rescued us from the domain of darkness. This evil kingdom that he's come and he snatched us out of this evil kingdom, Satan's kingdom of darkness. Now you ask yourself, I still kind of feel like I'm in it. 
Well, in some ways, yes, we still live in this world, and this world is racked with sin, and there's difficulty and pain and suffering. Yep, we're here. But spiritually speaking, we're not. He rescued us. We're out of it. We're still here physically, but we're out of it spiritually. And he goes on in the next idea and tells us where we are instead, and this is the third reason to be thankful. He's transferred us. Where has he transferred us? At the end of verse 13, he transferred us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. Some people like to use this to say that the kingdom is here today, right now, and I don't think that's what it's saying. Because if the kingdom was here today, right now, there would be no more sin, death, suffering, difficulty, pain, any of those things. Jesus would be ruling this planet in perfect harmony, in perfect righteousness, and everything would be great. If you want to tell me that the kingdom is here right now, I am radically disappointed in this kingdom. This is an awful kingdom if it's here right now. That's not what he's saying. He's transferred us to this kingdom of the Son that he loves. Where is this kingdom? Well, I like to say this kingdom is in abeyance. I like that word. It's like there. It's somewhere in outer space. It's it's hanging there in heaven. And we read in Revelation, you go to about the middle of the book of Revelation, Revelation 11 or so, and this kingdom is preparing to come down and to be established. And finally it is down and it's established and Jesus comes and he plops his kingdom on this planet and rules this planet in righteousness. But that's not yet. It's still up there. And when Jesus rescues us, when you come to know Jesus as your Savior and you trust in Christ as your Savior, you're rescued out of the domain of darkness and you're transferred into this kingdom that's awaiting its earthly habitation. So right now our citizenship is in heaven. And we can be thankful for that. See, Paul says a person who's in the middle of God's will is a person that's just marked by a ridiculous thankfulness. And a a thankfulness that just doesn't make sense. It's almost an irrational thankfulness. Why? Because, man, we've been qualified for an inheritance we didn't deserve. We've been rescued out of the domain of darkness. We've been transferred in the kingdom of his son. Wow! Thank you, God! And it all works back in the text. Patiently enduring right now. Even though those things are true, we're still patiently enduring what's happening right now. And the reason we can patiently endure is because we're filled with the knowledge of his will and we understand who he is. And so he kind of seals this up for the Colossian believers and he's trying to drive this point. Listen, you don't need legalistic additions to the gospel to guide your path in the Christian life. You don't need those things. What you have is already sufficient God is already directing your paths. He's directing your walk on life's path through the riches you already have in Christ. What riches that we already have in Christ? The riches of being qualified for an inheritance, of being rescued out of the domain of darkness, of being transferred in the kingdom of light. And friends, we've got to mine those riches. And when we mine those riches of who God is, the Spirit can give us the strength to know and to show. We can be thankful for who we are in Jesus, and we will be a fruitful tree bearing the fruit of God's will in our lives. I want to help you understand how this works. I'm going to borrow Carson and Judd. They're sitting down here. This is a great time. Come on up, guys. All right. Come on, stand, stand up here. I'm going to have one of you stand right here. And you stand right over here like this. Okay, there we go. Now, you guys are both trees, all right? And you've got tree leaves on your shirt this morning. It it couldn't have worked out better. Did you plan that? That's awesome. There's also tigers. All right, face out there. Look at everybody. Wave. All right, do your best tree imitation, guys. Uh, (coughs) Branches. There we go. You got it, Judd? All right, so let's see. Because he's got leaves on his, his tree, I'm, I'm going to do something with you, okay? Both of these trees want to produce fruit, all right? And there's two different ways to produce fruit, and, and we're going to call the fruit the knowledge of God's will. We all want to know what God's will is, and that fruit is the knowledge of God's will. So both of these trees want to produce that fruit of the knowledge of God's will. Now, like a lot of people, this tree named Carson here, he's focused on God's will. God, please show me your will. I want to do your will. God, I want to know what your will is. And you're viewing it like a puzzle. 
You're viewing it like an escape room, like a mystery. I'm trying to figure out what God's will is. And so all of your attention, all of your focus is just on that fruit itself of God's will. I want to try to figure that out. And you can look like you're figuring it out. You can even fool people. But this fruit is going to look like this. Hey, there's fruit. There's the fruit of God's will. But under better investigation, what you realize is it's just a piece of paper with the root word fruit written with a marker. You see that? You can tack fruit to your limbs. You can falsely produce fruit if you want to. You can search and try to find God's will and try to figure out what that is and produce at least what looks like the fruit of God's will. But in actuality, it's just a piece of paper with the word fruit written with a marker. Obviously, by a four-year-old, but actually, it was written by me. I have terrible handwriting. All right, Judson, now you are a Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14 tree, okay? What does that mean? What that means is that instead of trying to focus on this fruit out here, I really want to know God's will, all right? You realize, I don't produce this. I can't produce this. The text tells me that I'm going to be filled with the knowledge of God's will, passively. How do I get filled with the knowledge of God's will? What does the text tell me? The text tells me that I need to root down in the riches that I have in Jesus to know Him, to be filled with the knowledge of God through the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And so that deals with my roots. All right, so Judd, focus on your roots. All right, get down there and do some stuff with your roots. That looks good. All right, what are you doing with your roots? Why? Do, you, they're your roots. You should know what you're doing with them. You don't know? All right. Do, fix the roots. You got it? Good. Water the roots. Fertilize the roots. Spit on the floor. Do something. There you go. That looks good. Tying a shoe. That's, that's a good thing to do to your roots so you don't trip. All right. Stand up. Ready? Put those branches out. All right. Branches out from the roots here. He's knowing and understanding God better. And by knowing and understanding God better, the, the works are coming out. And the works are helping him understand God better. And he's patiently enduring. And you know what's interesting? The deeper your roots grow, the more you can endure, right? And so if I came and if I shoved you like that, see, you're strong because you got good roots, all right? You're patiently enduring and you're thankful because of those roots that you have and the riches of Jesus. And guess what happens? The fruit the fruit comes from the roots. I'm going to just trace this up here. The fruit comes up the tree. Is that kind of creepy? And look at that. Be careful. These are actual grapes here this morning. Look at that. Don't those look good? And you know what? I think they're probably pretty tasty too. Here, try one. There you go. Look at that. Is it good? All right. Let's taste this fruit. Is that tasty? <laughs> no, that's not good. All right. So, where did, now keep holding it, I don't want it yet. Where did this fruit come from? This fruit came from focusing on the roots. And the fruit was a byproduct of healthy roots. Where did this fruit come from? This fruit came by just trying to create fruit. It didn't come up from the roots. And this fruit's not very good. That fruit's pretty good. That's what Paul's trying to say here. You already have what you need in Christ to know and to do God's will. Don't let anybody come and tell you you have to hold candles and balance wax and close your eyes and blow candles out to try to find God's will. You already have what you need. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.